And welcome back to Meeting of the Minds. Today, I'm here with the great Ryan Grant. Ryan, thank you for joining us. Oh, you're very welcome. Uh, so much great work that you do. I'm a big fan of all, the, all your YouTube videos, everything you put out. So I'm just honored to have you on the show. Thanks. Well, I mean, thank, thank God, really, for uh, all the work and um, my need for money. It inspires me to get it done, <laughs> to uh, feed kids and whatnot. So that's, that's it. All right, we'll, we'll kick it in. So we were just talking about before in the show, you were a convert to the Catholic faith. Talk mm -hmm. about that. Um, it's not as exciting a conversion story as for most, but I was raised, I was baptized Episcopalian, and then my mother stopped going to church, and so we just didn't go to church. And there was no, so I grew up with virtually no church life, de facto agnostic. The only religious experience I had is my entire mother's side of the family is Jewish, and they lived in Bridgeport, Connecticut, so we would uh, travel to that part of the state, which is always a different thing. Eastern Connecticut versus Western Connecticut are almost completely different worlds. So, you know, not, not just because the East tends to be more Red Sox fans and the West tends to be more Yankees fans, but, <laughs> but also because the, um, the culture is different. The Western side's closer to New York, Bridgeport, Danbury, all those types of areas. So the, um, yeah, so my first experiences were with uh, Jewish relatives and doing uh, various uh, Yom Kippur, Hanukkah, Tabernacles, um, some, some Shabbat, uh, some Saturdays, and, and until basically my great-grandmother died. And then all her children were largely atheists, and they'd mostly kept it up. So then it starts waning, and then they would do Rosh Hashanah and Hanukkah, and we'd go up for Hanukkah, and that would be you know, and it still really didn't make that much sense to me. You know, it's interesting doing all these things. There was never a sense of God in that particular picture. It's kind of more of this kind of anomalous entity on the outside, uh, which was which was curious. It was interesting. So then, um, yeah, then we grew up, and at some point in my teens, I said, "Hey, I need religion. I need to know about this Jesus guy," because I didn't know anything about our Lord except um, that if I said his name, I got in trouble. And I didn't know why. <laughs> I didn't know why this was important. <laughs> that's all. It, that's all it mattered. It meant to me is I didn't know anything else. And so we went back to the Episcopal Church, uh, where I was for I don't know how many years, three years, gradually kind of getting it. And it was an interesting church because when uh, so when my mother was um, when we were baptized there, I think they were married there too. My mother, and my father, um, the, uh, the 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 Episcopal, the Episcopal minister actually faced the altar. And they still, when I went back at 13, they didn't do that anymore, but they still gave uh, Anglican communion at the altar rail, which actually sets up an interesting thing later. Um, so that, that was my religious experience for a number of years until, goodness, and I think three years, three and a half years or something, about the time I was 16 going on 17, when my mother had been watching EWTN and she'd been watching Mother Angelica and she wanted to come back to the church and receive the Eucharist. So then she basically said to my brother and I, all right, well, we're gonna be Catholic now. Whew, go over to the Catholic cathedral in, Nor in Norwich, Connecticut. And I was just like, all right, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and some kind of instruction took first communion, didn't eat. And the interesting thing with communion was I kind of looked at the, the game where uh, the, the situation where, in the Anglican church, we knelt at the altar rail and it was bread. And it was clear that it was bread. And the minister had said it was it was just bread. But we knelt down for it and received it. And of course, they didn't also bring the chalice around too and whatnot. But now in the Catholic church, we stood. We just kind of walked up in line and most people took this right in their hand. So I said, well, obviously I can't be Jesus because that that's that's silly. You wouldn't do that if it was really Jesus, you know? So it, it must just be a symbol. And for like the first year, I think I believed it was just a symbol first year that I was Catholic because the praxis wasn't matching up with the theology. And it wasn't, then somebody preached on and I said, really? We really do believe that? Oh, okay. <laughs> and there was all so like I said, there's nothing dramatic. There's no tole lege moment of um, all of a sudden I get it. It wasn't an intellectual conversion. It was mostly okay. This is what we're doing now. And then gradually, slowly, there was a kind of more and more interest, more and more desire, and that which en ended up um, bringing me to uh, Steubenville, where I went to college at Franciscan University, which um, which was an interesting experience, giving rise to so much of my nuttiness and immaturity. And now I was free. And um, yeah, if you talk to people that knew me in college, they said, oh yeah, I remember that guy was nutty. He did all these kind of weird things <laughs> and, and who knows what else. And so, um, but it, that was a gradual process. And then 
um, at the end of that, started to become an atheist because I'd read um, uh, Nietzsche and got, got through Nietzsche and, it, and he convinced me. It was a very powerful argument. And so I became more or less an agnostic or an atheist, now formally, um, for at least a year and a half. And sometimes I pretend and sometimes it's still go to mass. And theology was still the most, uh, probably my greatest interest, even though I didn't believe. And sometimes I'd be reading it, saying, you know, just thinking in my head, oh, if only I could, I could believe again. But I didn't. And so somebody somewhere was praying for me because I didn't deserve it. I did not deserve to get the faith back because I'd thrown it away. And uh, then somebody somewhere was praying, God, please, please bring Ryan back to the faith. And, and that's precisely what happened. So it was, and again, it's just a grace. Just finally, you know, I, I see it again. And so and I went to confession, went back to mass. That's great. Then, ha then how did you learn Latin and Greek and all these other languages? Um, let's see. I started learning Latin in college. I, I, I had a little bit of success, but not a whole lot. And I got to a point where I could kind of read with a dictionary, but that was really hard. It's very hard to read a text with a dictionary. Um, it's rather miserable, actually. It's, it's how I get through French these days. <laughs> it is because I'm terrible at French. And I can't speak it to save my life, but at least I can read a, a theological essay or text in French. Get, for, more, for the most part, the gist of it. I would never translate that. Um, so Latin was, was a difficult thing to get mostly because I had, uh, you know, we had these books like, uh, Henley, for example, as one of those ones that everyone goes to and they use in their homeschooling curriculums. They're horrible. They're death by grammar. And you just, you never get anywhere and you're doing endless, endless exercises and you just don't ever arrive at, at anything, especially self-taught. And, and, and it's very, very hard to pick it up that way. So I was never, and syntax is almost impossible. Then I went to Wheelocks and I'd used Wheelocks a little bit in college. And, and that was another one where, okay, I'm translating these sentences. I'm going through, I'm getting this. And then um, in the book throws in, say the subjunctive mood at the very end, kind of like, is this appendix to the language, but it's half the language or more sometimes. And it's treatment of the passive voice was very weak, a pun intended there, if you know about arguments and grammar about that and so it was again so I came out and I kind of got I got the gist of mass because uh, at the time I was going to the, the traditional Latin mass or the extraordinary form but um, I wasn't you know I still couldn't put it together and read a text coherently so I finally got something out I don't remember what it was whether it was St. Augustine or it was Cicero some some you know text and so I just opened up uh, it might have been Confessions or City of God but I can't actually remember which one it was or maybe it was uh, um Date Republica and Cicero. But anyway, so I'm looking at it and I just said, I'm going to look up every single word that's on this page and I'm going to learn it. I'm going to keep reading this page until I can read every word in context, integrally, and it all makes sense. And that's what I did. <laughs> and then I went to the next page and did the exact same thing. And then as I progressed, it was getting easier and easier. And basically what I had done, <clears throat> pardon me, is I had used a natural method of learning Latin beyond the death by grammar books. And suddenly I got it and it made sense. So then I was able to read fairly easily without having to look things up um, until actually uh, I got into a book um, which Father Ripperger actually commissioned me to do, which is Cardinal Franzen's On Divine Tradition. And as I went through that, um, yes, that one right there. And as I went through it, it... it um, twirled my head around in, in pretzels because it all the scholastic terminology that I just didn't really have a good acquaintance with at a scholarly level. So I had to sit down mostly with him and then on my own, just going through the lexicon of St. Thomas, which if anyone's ever seen that work, it breaks down all the very complicated scholastic technical terminology. And you get a, like a very easygoing word like res, essay. Um, all of these sorts of things that are pages and pages and pages of definitions, terminology, technical terminology, specific meanings in this context with examples from the Summa or the commentary and the sentences or Demala, some other work of St. Thomas. And so going through that, and that's actually one of the criticisms I've had in that translation of Franzlin. It was the first book I ever translated. It took me a number of years, actually, um, even though I've done twice as much in far shorter a time, um, was I was too scared of missing a technical term or a distinction. So I kept some things a lot more literal. And that's one thing that um, it was, you know, because it is a very technical word, um, as opposed to something like, say, Bellarmine is far more apologetic. A lot of it's more easygoing. There are technical terms there, but, um, you know, not as, not as difficult or complicated as Franzlin. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's something. So is that the best way you'd recommend going about Latin? That's the way I'd recommend it. There's also uh, books. So there's one book. Um, I taught this for a while, and this actually helped me quite a bit. Um, it was by Hans Orberg. It's called Lingua Latina. Um, I think I have that one. Yeah, I don't have a copy here. I'm just looking over there. Um, but anyway. Lingua Latina. It's, here it is. Yeah. So the entire thing's in Latin. Yeah. Uh, you know, like it says, Latina per se illustrata. It's, uh, you know, shown by, through itself or, you know, illustrated, taught by itself. And if you don't have any good notions of grammar, as most Americans don't, <laughs> it becomes very complicated as a self-taught book. But if you do understand basic things like subject and object and, you know, a case ending or you're used to Spanish with verbs changing endings and such and tenses and things of this sort and how to form those, then it, it'll be a little easier to approach something like that. I actually sell a book, Mediatrics Press sells a book, which is called Latin by the Natural Method by Father Most, which um, is, is kind of bridges the gap in, in that kind of method from say Orberg, where the entire book is in Latin, to uh, this where he has a lot of text, you know, fairly well written, basic, just building up basically slowly, um, you know, with uh, readings that have facing vocabulary. And I mean, he starts with uh, Mary had a little lamb and three little pigs in Latin. <laughs> and, and then you uh, go through that, um, you know, the structure in, in just basic grammatical concepts. And then you see them in context, how they're working in context of paragraphs, not kind of pithy artificial sentences you have to translate. And so whereas all this is, and he's written from the standard, basically a fourth century Latin the fourth century AD, the later Latin and the way it was done. And then his style starts moving backwards as you get through the book and he has re readings that are summaries of the Vulgate basically after a while. First it's Roman history, then it's the Vulgate. And, and then he's introducing you know, more and more concepts and very important ones very early, such as the passive voice. And again, the subjunctive, you get all that in book one. And then book two is getting into the more complicated syntax that takes you through all the collects of the, the mass as it was in his time. So that's the extraordinary form and which are all, um, you know, most of those are from the early period of the church when, you know, by people who were fluent in Latin and are employing very complicated or oratorical style, rhetorical styles to, you know, to, to create these prayers. And so once you get through those, you have all the building blocks. And then there's volume, th volume three, which we haven't published yet which is on Cicero and Augustine. Nice. So you'd recommend going through those two volumes then also that- um, I, Hopefully I, by the time you do it, I'll have volume three out there. I've got a long list of people that uh, will get a volume three who bought the set. So, and then yeah, for, for further clarity, I mean, at that point you'll be ready to just kind of breeze through Orberg really it won't be much of a problem. Okay, great, great. Hey, how did you get linked up with Father Ripperger? That's great. He was my pastor about uh, 12, 13 years ago here in Pooze Falls. Wow. Wow. That's great. That's great. And I, and I see, it seems like a lot of Catholic works, a lot of the classics, they haven't been translated. I was surprised that mm -hmm. there's a lot of work out there that wasn't translated. I just got through uh, Prumer, the, the handbook, but not the, what, what's, what's the difference? There's a handbook and then there's the more uh, Manuale Theologia Moralis. So yes. this, this guy right here, it's three in three volumes. And so the, the handbook is basically an abridgment uh, right. It's basically a, uh, what would you call it? Yeah, an, an, an abridged version. And the fuller one has a number of treatises, tractatus, and then in the, within the tractatus, then there's a subject. So like in the second volume that I've got here, um, what's it intend to go through? Um, so on, on basically, so you have the first part, on the virtue of justice and the opposing vices. And then it goes into sections and, uh, you know, it goes into things, a lot of the traditional tracks, the justitia iure, for example, on, on justice and right, on, um, you know, in, in other elements of virtue, so the Decalogue and uh, all the, the various elements that that affects in our lives. So it's basically drawing out the gospel, the moral law, the fathers, and, you know, but dealing with concrete, examples of how these virtues are applied and laying down various principles based on so many other uh, moral theologians. Yeah, it makes sense. And I learned that, um, I think, before the 1900s, or maybe even after that, that almost all the moral theology manuals were in Latin. Mm -hmm. Because they were designed principally for the priest. And the reason they were given a, a design for the priest is that he was supposed, it was as the priest, when he sits in the confessional, 
and is the, the minister of God's tribunal, he needs to help the penitent determine what is a sin, what isn't a sin. And so people sometimes complain, oh, moral theology has all these loopholes and things that, well, they're not loopholes. It's rather determining, have you sinned and have you not? And so, and that's, it's simply trying to just apply the principles of the Decalogue of the, the, you know, divine precept of ecclesiastical precept of how the fathers have interpreted, you know, the, the, the maxims of our Lord in scripture and in, in, in moral theology, divine positive law, natural law, and how all of these things impact, you know, what we do in these cases in a very narrow, complicated things. This is one of the errors um, in, in thinking and in praxis since Vatican II, I would say, uh, a little bit before, but principally in, with a certain way of thought that became dominant after the councils. Like, yeah, we need to get rid of all this uh, casuistry and get, you know, all de jettison all these kind of de intricate little moral discussions and just go back to the purity of the gospel. Um, well, whether that's the right approach or not, the last 70 years, I think uh, it would be hard to argue we've seen a renaissance of moral life in Christ in the church and in society. So there, there's something wrong. And part of it was it, a lot of people just need that very simple thing. Is this right? Is it wrong? And, you know, a priest that has had a basic, a good education, has the authorities that he, he can consult, he can look at it and say, yeah, this was wrong. This was a sin. This wasn't. And so, or, well, there's opinions in these matters. And so I'm going to make a judgment where it's free, where it's kind of more, because in some, some opinions, it's more free. And you have certain, you know, certain discussions that, uh, that it's not resolved and said, this is the more probable opinion. Therefore, we should probably, we should follow it, right? It's a doctrine called probabilism, which is uh, mostly supported by St. Alphonsus Liguori, for example. You know, it basically, uh, as opposed to other systems that have similar names. And so it's like, yeah, we'll lay this down for you. You probably should do this, but don't do that. And, and, and that's what people need. People just need that really simple affirmation because not everyone's a theologian and not everyone can be. Some people can and just need the training and getting there, you know, can be really hard and you shouldn't have to scrutinize, you know, 10 or 15 different books in Latin in order to find out, can I do this or not? <laughs> Right. What's the biggest difference between Prumer's handbook and 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 those three volumes and mm -hmm. manual as well as and versus Saint Alphonsus, which that's one of your works that you translate. Right. Let me pull that up here so I can give the shameless plug. Yes. Um, going. There we go. In case anyone's wondering. So right now it's in two volumes. I'm still working on volume three. That's my Christmas break project to get through. So the difference is uh, Alphonsus is much more exhaustive. It originally started as a commentary on a Jesuit uh, moralist named Henry Busenbaum. He was a German Jesuit and, and um, Alphonsus really uh, felt that he had the best summation of so many things, but he didn't go far enough. So it started as a commentary just in small points, adding extra details from the tradition where Busenbaum hadn't really covered. That's why when you get into the text and you see this section of text, I have it in the preface, but I can tell who doesn't read the preface when I get an email. Hey, what are all these, these sections with quotes around it? You know? <laughs> uh, so basically that's the text of Henry Busenbaum that Alphonsus is, is commenting on. And sometimes he departs from that altogether to add in treatises he's written and other things. But he, um, like his treatise on law, which takes up the first section of the book actually, but it lays the grounding for his whole thinking as he's progressing through the, the work. So he takes on all the different arguments, all the different elements, which are, um, you know, obviously the, the notion of law itself and its divisions, and then uh, sin, vice, as well as virtue and the theological virtues. Then he, he moves on to the Ten Commandments. After just done with the Ten Commandments, he does Ecclesiastical Precepts, which is substantially the next two volumes, I believe. I have to go double check where the where I've got my layout for what's coming in English. But um, then the sacraments too. Is it, you know, sin if the sacraments are said this way? If in there, so obviously there'll be some things that are somewhat antiquated from where we're at now, but there's other things that are you know, entirely applicable. Like if you take a certain principle, it's in, um, it's in the second volume on the third commandment. And, you know, it, when is the burden too great to uh, go to where you can say you're relieved of the obligation to go to mass in terms of say travel. And they said, if they, it takes you more than an hour of travel, well, that might be the case. If you live like six or seven miles outside of town, it might take you more than an hour to get there. In which case you're relieved of you, you, the burden of um, your, your conscience shouldn't be burdened with the obligation. Um, so we can apply that same principle to today where we have motor vehicles, except now it's not seven miles out of town, but 70 miles out of town where it's going to take you, 
you know, over an hour to get there. Now that's not to say that you shouldn't, but you could apply that principle. Okay. Well, I didn't make it. I couldn't, I couldn't get the kids out. This one's missing this, this one's missing that. And the only mass time was at nine o'clock and, uh, you know, and the priest can then unburden your conscience. Okay. The, well, it wasn't a sin because it wasn't, um, you know, the law itself, you weren't obligated by it because of this distance and how long it's going to take and, and uh, the serious inconvenience. Uh, inconvenience doesn't sound like the right word, but how unsuitable it is to demand you do this in these circumstances. So. All right. So, so Alphonsus is more exhaustive than, than Prumer is. Yeah, far more exhaustive than Prumer, actually. And um, even the Prumer's work is very good. So, uh, Blessed Pius IX had said, said um, that if any confessor could consult St. Alphonsus's work uh, safely without reference to any other work. Wow. What, what um, document was that in? I'm not, I can't think, I think it was in the Bull of Canonization, but it might have been in another um, decree. I, gotta, I have it somewhere. I've got to find it, but. Excellent. Wow. Yeah, that's great stuff. How long does it normally take you to, to translate these books? I'm going to. Uh, it depends. Uh, the like Saint Alphonsus, the the text I'm working with for the translation itself is a lot smaller. It's an 18th century, um, 19th century edition, so it's smaller. So I go through those pages a lot faster. Uh, Bellarmine, on the other hand, um, his works are in a quarto folio volume. They're very large. I actually have one from the 1720s that I'm using, and that will probably can do about a page in a in a half in an hour. I think I think that's right. Maybe sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on what he's doing and, and how, uh, you know, how complicated it gets in or how much I got to look up to with um, certain, uh, you know, with the scripture verses, I'm going to keep it close to the Dewey reams just because that's public domain. You know, I have to alter it a little bit. Sometimes you get in a place where the Dewey translators understood a verse very differently than Bellarmine and it's clear from the context. So I've got to look in now into commentaries, what other people have said about it, how, how the Greek is, what other languages translated it to make sure that, you know, if I alter this translation to fit be what Bellarmine is, how he understands it, that I'm right in line with where it should be. And it's not something that's going to be completely wrong. So that, that's, uh, so sometimes that'll stop me for like a half hour going through to make sure that's absolutely right. Because then once it's gone off to the editor, it's probably not going to get caught as easily as, uh, you know, and, and unless I put a footnote there or something or a little bracket to say, hey, come back and check this later while well, I'm working on it, so. Yeah, because I was thinking they're probably not going to catch something if you make a small mistake. In it. No, my, um, the editor I have now, um, a very competent lady, especially in grammar, uh, much more so than I am, but she her Latin is, you know, so 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 she's not you know she, she'll catch a sentence that's awkward which usually is i started to write it one way and then i went and changed it but i didn't change it all and there's something left over and so so it's circled and it says awkward fix you know and that's easy and then I go back to the latin oh i see what i did there but um if there is a mistranslation from the latin they're not going to see it so that's why i have to then you know send it to a couple of priests that read it by the ripper read it. usually in two i'm in communication with people hey so this scholastic term is being used in this way, but is there a way to vernacularize this or do I have to stick it in Latin with a footnote? And what, what would you recommend? People who are scholarly and published, you know, ask them and then I'll get that advice and get that in there. So just to make sure, you know, I mean, there's always gonna be something somewhere. And that's true even of extremely competent translators a century ago, uh, De Ferrari comes to mind. Um, trying to think of some others that, uh, you know, uh, Callan, uh, Callan, for example, um, his translation of the Catechisms of the Council of Trent, I remember um, it was being, somebody was showing to me, I can't remember the issue now, several years ago, where there was a mistranslation on a certain section in that, um, which wasn't a very great substance or importance, but it, you know, it was very minor. But nevertheless, um, you know, this stuff shows up. And if like you go through work, you find two, three mistakes. So that was actually pretty common and even the very great masters. So, and I'm not a very great master of it, uh, mostly self-taught. So, and actually, you know, I have a circle of people that I know that are also very fluent in Latin. And some of them, you know, you get in the room with them, I'd actually be the least impressive person there. So it's, um, you know, which honor and privilege to know them and be a part of that. But at the same time, you know, that has, I just have to acknowledge that at the forefront. You know, I'm just kind of bulldozing through this and getting it done because it needs to be gotten done. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. I, you know, I always wonder why, why more of the documents aren't, aren't translated over because I mean, mm -hmm. this is church, this is our right this, this is our tradition we need this mm -hmm. and, and so many documents like i think of um cornelius a lapidae I, mm -hmm. I remember when i went through my reversion about five years ago they said that was one of the best 
Bible commentaries. Right. Said, okay. Well, well, where is it? Okay. The new Testament, but they don't have the old Testament. They're yet. working on it. <laughs> well, I know they're they working on it. Yeah. The old Testament. Um, right now they're trying to finish the new Testament because they have the gospels and certain of the Catholic epistles really, and right? the, uh, there were, I know Loretto is working on acts of the apostles and Romans. Um, actually I'm working on Romans for them. So it's, um, and I, actually, hey, I'm sure they'd be eager to get some, some of that because I haven't sent them anything in a while. So I've been snowed in with work. But um, so actually, if you, your listeners too want to support that Lapide project, go to Loretto because they are seeking funding or also more translators too to work on it. So it's, it's so big, especially as I, I just recently learned about talking about the, the interpretation of the fathers, Father Ripperger's book, The Unanimous Consent mm-hmm. of the Fathers. Right. One, Council of Trent. You know, the, you're just seeing this over and over again. And why? Why wasn't that brought up? That 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 really enhances to me the magnitude of Lapidae's commentary mm-hmm. and the Catena probably also right. That's the fathers also, Caten the Catena, um, Platina, Catina, um, Catina, Catina. Yeah, I've, I'm C-A-T-E-N. drawing a blank on that one. Um, I know it may be a mix of two people up. So I know Platina, who was a historian um, during the Renaissance and basically any commentaries by the fathers that you're aware of yeah Uh-oh. so there there's a there's a good number of those uh in terms of commentaries of the fathers there's the famous catena area of uh, saint thomas that's, aquinas that's what i meant the oh, that's area. what you're looking at yeah yeah um so i probably i didn't hear it right so it's not i should probably uh, i don't have my headphones so i can't put plug it in coming off the uh, computer here it's, it's a much older computer so it's making a lot of noise unfortunately so um i'll turn you up a little bit yeah, no, that's um, yeah. So that's yeah, there's that. There's also um, you know, it's Catholic University of America Press. They have they've been publishing the Fathers in translation for a while. Not a lot of people know about, it, and there's a lot of obscure work. So like a lot of people go to New Advent. You know, oh look, here's the Fathers. But it's um, it's from a very usable Protestant edition. Um, I I've caught a few errors here and there, but never anything that was super substantial. You know, again, translators. There's always a mistake somewhere. But um, in in my work as well. But um, there was, let's see, so there's that, but it's not complete by any means, especially you look at St. Jerome. They got a paltry number of works there and his stuff is massive. Um, now Catholic University of America has been publishing that. I do believe they published uh, St. Jerome, uh, all of it. 